If we compare humans to other forms of life on this planet, it is clear that we are defenseless in our natural state. We need the prosthetic additions provided by technology in order to survive. Lions with claws, dogs with teeth, snakes with venom, alligators with steel-lined jaws, plants with toxins can kill us easily. Our leaky bodies and our fragile skin allows all sorts of diseases to flourish. This results in a perpetual war within our bodies where zombie invasions are enacted every second. Biology tells us that in the beginning was the virus and it ruled over life. So viruses and bacteria were there from the beginning, so it only makes sense that they are in control. The interesting thing about viruses is that they are like zombies. They occupy the space between life and death. They are not by themselves alive and need to enter a cell, take it over, and then multiply its venomous substance. There are more viruses than there are stars in the universe. A recent book by Dahlia Schweitzer entitled Going Viral, Zombies, Viruses, and the End of the World makes the claim that our fear of viral infections is overblown. She claims that outbreak narratives where diseases ravage the human population only engage in raising public paranoia. The only people who profit from the outbreak narrative are the power brokers who capitalize on our fear, she thinks. I think such a view is irresponsible and very dangerous. Clearly, based on the recent COVID-19 pandemic, our fear of viral infections are not overblown. Viral infections are real, and they can bring civilization to a halt within a very short time. Overall, the pandemic showed us that we are not in control and those who are in control have no business leading anything. Bacteria are the oldest forms of life on the planet. There are more bacteria in our bodies than there are human cells. The largest number exists in our stomach and gut and on our skin. Several species of bacteria are pathogenic and cause infections and disease. The word bacteria means staph, the staff is something that provides support. It is a pillar or a foundation. This is telling for our purposes, since bacteria are the support for life. Scientists reveal that bacteria and viruses evolved together. As bacteria increased in diversity and complexity, new viruses evolved to be able to utilize the bacteria as a replication factory. Robert Edwards tells us that viruses are the most abundant biological entities on the planet. They populate every ecosystem and are found everywhere life exists. Here we see that life and death are intertwined. The speculation here is interesting. The origin of life is both bacterial and viral. That is, something alive and something undead. Life at its origin is already, therefore, zombified biologically. Horror movies always like to play with the idea that the virus will wipe out life. But if we are a combination of bacteria and viruses, then what exactly is being wiped out? If viruses are like hijackers who take what isn't theirs, then humans may be the ultimate virus. In fact, this is how Nietzsche sees human beings as viruses who ravage the earth. The zombie hordes that have invaded our screens in the last 100 years are really a glimpse of our own behavior. We are monstrous, which is the reason our myths, stories, and films are so full of them. Jared Diamond, in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, shows us that diseases have animal origin. He shows us that diseases that ravaged humanity, such as smallpox, the flu, malaria, measles, etc., all came from animals. When humans developed agriculture, they lived with animals. Diamond writes, Some farming populations make it even easier for their own fecal bacteria and worms to infect new victims. 
by gathering their feces and urine and spreading them as fertilizer on the fields where people work. Sedentary farmers became surrounded not only by their feces, but also by disease-transmitting rodents attracted by the farmers' stored food. The rise of cities was a greater one, as still more densely packed human populations festered under even worse sanitation conditions. Diamond's point is that the shift from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to an agricultural city lifestyle resulted in many diseases taking root within human populations. Given the conditions of sanitation during medieval times and right into our modern era, diseases spread out of control. When we examine the history of medicine, it is indeed shocking that it is only about 150 years old. To put this into perspective, it was in 1846 that Ignaz Hygiene brought down the death rate among new mothers by insisting that doctors wash their hands before treating women in childbirth. In 1865, Joseph Lister provided the principles of antiseptics and ward treatment. And in 1870, Louis Pasteur established the germ theory of disease. Given the vast amount of ineptitude and idiocy, it is quite amazing that we have survived at all. There was a certain wisdom to be had in having an outhouse that was out of the house. Then some bright person thought it would be a good idea to bring the toilet inside and place it next to the sink where the toothbrush is, which ensures that the microscopic fecal matter is sprayed on said brush after every flush. And you can still see people leave the bathroom stall after having urinated or defecated and not wash their hands. They go on to touch door handles, coffee lids, computer keyboards, and other surfaces. Here, dogs have much to teach us as they go outside far from where they live, while cats enjoy the open toilet of the in-house litter box that is dutifully scooped by their human servants. It is no wonder diseases are spread so easily among human populations. The zombie represents our mindlessness and the part of ourselves that is abject and grotesque. You are aware of the abject most when you are sick. This is where boundaries break down. As Buddhist scriptures tell us, we ooze fluid, pus, bile, and blood. It is not that we fear monsters, we fear our own monstrosity. The revulsion we have of zombies is a revulsion of ourselves. Our insides are an in-between what is clearly me and what is not me at all. The French sociologist Jean Baudelaire argues that the virus contains within them the logic of our system. It is as if viruses know how to use our weaknesses against us. The virus is undead and omnipotent. It moves from body to body in order to infect, thrive, and survive. The virus, as Derrida writes, introduces disorder into communication. Is there an adaptation to life with the plague? The plague shows us that the problems of extreme individualism and selfishness cannot exist. Pandemics call us to embrace a renewed sense of community and another social order where hope, love, and courage aren't mere words. A plague is an affliction. What afflicts us and gives us trouble causes us vexation and calamity. Monsters do exist. They are not just allegorical and symbolic, but real. The living dead do not represent the fragility of life. Rather, they represent the insistence and persistence of evil. Plague comes from the Latin word for wound. We are struck down, afflicted, conflicted, and infected. We are assailed and troubled as we search for ways out of the distress and dis-ease. We are made uneasy by the choices framed for us by others, 
especially when we see how little control we actually have over viral diseases that threaten our survival.